Good afternoon and welcome back everybody to part two of the four cornerstones of a successful business, successful portrait business, sorry, successful business portrait, portrait business, what do you think? We're off to a fired. great start. Yeah. I'm fired, that's it, get this uh, guy out of here. We could do start. that, we could totally you know do that too, I'm just... I totally could do the how to have a successful portrait, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> A business portrait. There you go. I think I think I've just officially fired myself and handed the reins over to Rod. Take it away. You you officially own the show now. Have Completely you made it ten years? The program tonight, <laughs> Scott. Have I, you made it ten years? I did. I'm I'm official. Okay. It's official as of July. Okay. 10th, it's been ten years. Yes. Yeah, so nice. Okay. Celebrated my ten year anniversary, but that's not what people came to hear about. They 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 came to hear <laughs> about how to run a successful portrait business. Nice. That's, that's, there we go. Nice that's, done. That's that's what people came to hear about. We're joined by Monica Sigmund, Michael Taylor, and Rod Evans, who you should all be familiar with at this point. And if not, not to worry. I know Danny's in the background, already ready to drop the link from part one. So in case you missed it, you can catch up on that. If you have any questions that you want to get answered, you know how it goes. This is an open forum, and that's what we're here to do. We're here to answer the difficult questions that nobody wants to ask, but ask them. That's what we're here to do. If you're joining us on Zoom, go ahead and drop a comment in the Q&A tab. If you're joining us on Vimeo or Facebook, you can go ahead and use the comment section. Uh, now, you may be noticing that Tim and Bev Walden aren't here today. Unfortunately, they couldn't join us. They had some unforeseen circumstances come up, which barred them from being here tonight, but everything is okay in that camp. They did send a wonderful video message to kind of kickstart things. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to get that queued up for everybody. We're going to take a look at that and then uh, pass it over to Rod. How's that sound, guys? Sounds good. Man. All right. I'll tell you how sad we are that we can't be there tonight. Uh, circumstances that do not allow, and we're sad not to be there. But we'll be there for the rest of them. You can count on that. But, you know, we got to put our two cents in, right? <laughs> Especially talking about style, because yeah. that's been such an important part of what has brought us to this point in the photography business and the portrait business uh, and in being successful, as I've mentioned before, turning a business around that was failing. And I think photographers, when it comes to style, have an advantage, Bev, in the fact that we can build our brand around our style and we get to determine what our style is, where so many businesses maybe sell common products and they certainly they have to build their style around those products, but those products are available a lot of different places. You might say photography is available a lot of different places, but the reality is you have a uniqueness. You have the ability to define yourself in such a way that you can separate yourself from the masses and rise to the top. And I think one of the things that I see happening over and over again in our industry is that when people get into photography, they look at what everyone else is doing right. and they go, I can do that. Or even worse, I can do that better. Yeah. <laughs> do people really see the difference? We, I don't think we want to ask ourselves, can I do that? It's what can I do that carries quality and excellence, but it's original and unique and different uh, from what the masses are doing. Yeah, I was going, you hit on the word original. Yep, right. Um, I remember years ago we saw Ann Getty speak and the one thing that really stuck with us is she said, I'm I don't, not really better than anybody else, but my idea was original. Yeah. I had originality going for me and I, I, you know, a copy is never as good as an original. That's right. You've heard that saying and, you know, find your lane, find who you are. We talked about this in the last, uh, right. the last series that we just did. And it is really that important. And it's, it really comes from your heart. And uh, you will find your spot because everything else you do will feel awkward or unfulfilling yeah. or uh, just kind of boring, you know, yeah. uh, even if you're a good copier. <laughs> It gets boring and you, don't you know, want to be the copy. no, yeah. I mean, and we've all done that. We've right. all been there. We've all seen a speaker and, and we've, with stars in our eyes, we've said, I'm going to go back and do that. What you can do though, Bev, I believe 
is to pull pieces from everybody. Right, and we all that's, are. And that's who we, we all, all are. So yeah. uh, you will see threads through our work of a lot of different people who've influenced us and who we've exactly. studied with. Right. So don't don't feel like I can't do anything similar or I can't pull from that information and technique and feeling uh, and, and design, whatever that might be, mm -hmm. because you can take all those parts like a puzzle, put them together to make a very unique you. Mm -hmm. And I think that's very, very important. <clears throat> I think the other thing about style for us, and this is, this is just from our perspective, but when a style has an emotional tag to it, that's important. Uh, it really elevates it in the eyes of, of the client because mm -hmm. we have a tendency to think of style in the way we execute a photograph, the way we light it and pose it. And certainly that plays into it. But the reality is, too, yeah. when there can be an emotional tag to it, and emotional tag can mean a lot of different things. But for me, it can mean learning about the people you're photographing learning their story, learning about their personality, and then to begin to find subtle ways to create that. Now, I know a lot of people do things like this very literally. They take a story and they can literally <laughs> yeah. execute that right. in the image, maybe through composites and all. Those things are amazing. They they're, are amazing. They're amazing. But Absolutely. For, for you and I, it's about learning about, <laughs> uh, you know, like, a, a, a mom might say, when I look in his eyes, you know, I see his father, I see his father in those eyes, and it just, mm -hmm. it just softens my heart. And I can't yeah. tell you how it changes you, but when you're in the camera room and you know these stories, you know these little subtleties, yeah. then you'll begin to see that person differently. You'll push the button at a different time. And then what's really neat about that is when you're in a selection appointment, they're making their decisions, you're not saying, well, don't you love the light there? Don't you love your expression? You're saying, do you remember the story you told mm -hmm. me? Do you remember what you said about your son? I see that in that photograph. So that, and what that does is it takes the photography and the style and it flips it over to making it something that features uh, and makes the hero your clients and your subjects. Yeah, and I think what's amazing to me is once you know someone's story, yeah. it's somehow as the photographer, you pick it up when you're shooting and it could be just such a subtle glance to the side or a hand the way uh, somebody's touching somebody else uh, it's body language and it's subtle but right. it's there Absolutely. the story is there and you can look at it and you can almost read it's almost like having it printed you can read it when you look at that portrait and to me that's like full circle they told you the story, mm -hmm. you captured the story, now they're looking at the story photographically of Correct. their family or, right. or child or whoever the subject is. And it's like full circle and there's so much satisfaction yeah, in that. Absolutely, all these things are so important and our friends who are sharing with you tonight, they bring such wisdom and creativity yes. and depth yeah. and roundness. I've listened to everything Every word. they say because mm -hmm. I do, I do because I learn so much mm -hmm. being exactly. around them. But I want to, I just, I want to finish with, with just one thought on style too. And that is that we, this is the hard part. I think most, the, the most important part of style, you can be very good at a lot of different things, but when you show a lot of different things, you're not building identity. So you can actually, do a lot of great things, but they can hinder the greater cause of people recognizing you. Right. Because part of style, marketing, branding is messaging who you are and being exceptional at it. Right. When you do 15, 20 different things, oh yeah, I can do that, I can do this. Sure, we can go there, we can do this. <laughs> yeah. And you might do a good job, but the reality is for people to be able to see that has to be like a funnel. You have to hone it down to mm -hmm. what you're passionate about and what you're excellent at. And the hard part, I think, on style is you have to be willing to let a lot of good things go. That's hard. Yes, for the greater cause the greater of the cause. exceptional things mm -hmm. that cause you to be recognized. Yeah. I, I believe to this day, and I think I mentioned it last time we talked, is it's, it's, it's less important that people like what you do and more important that they know what you do. Mm -hmm. And I know I've said that. But because we're always worried, well, this person likes that, this person likes that. And then we create this hodgepodge, this potpourri of looks, and it truly doesn't identify us. Mm -hmm. So the reality is we need to be identified. And the, and the last thing on that is as you find that place, 
you'll get better at it because yeah. when you hone yourself into just who you are and what you're passionate about, you'll focus on the things to make that excellent. The lighting, the posing, the clothing, the composition and design. Mm -hmm. And you'll start hyper-focusing. And when you do that, then you're going to create things at the next possible level. Yeah, and you won't feel like you're jumping through hoops. Yeah. Like you're a circus, you know, do it, yeah. ksh, do yeah. this, do that. Um, and I never liked that feeling yeah. that I was jumping through this hoop and that hoop and that hoop to try to do everything and it's it's all um, it's comforting and it's inspiring and it will create such a better artist inside sure. of you when you know what you want to do and you do it and then you improve it Absolutely. and you work on it and you focus on it and it rises to the top like cream rises to the top you will yeah. rise to the top so guys we're sorry we're not there tonight hanging out with all of you, hanging out with our friends, but yeah. you're in good company, and we'll look forward to seeing you next time. Aww. Aww. I'm okay, so I've, inspired. You know, I'm going to so say inspired. that the, we just did the cardinal sin I know. of when speakers are we in yeah. the PPA world is you never follow Tim and Bev. <laughs> <laughs> Ever. You know, and why we let you play that video you know, to start the podcast out, but so we're done. Up. You know, we're done. Thank you very much. Thanks for showing up. Yeah, we'll see you next week. <laughs> Every time. That's, that's that's what you get for for making fun of me for not being able to speak properly. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. But uh, should I show some of Tim's work, or is everybody? Yeah, familiar I think with it'd be. It, what I think it'd be think? good because they really epitomize honing in on that style. They have not deviated, but their work stays timeless. So I just thought if each of us could show a little bit of our work to just kind of get an example of um, of what we're known for. This is that's perfect. My printer doing stuff. <laughs> okay. So That's Tim and Bev, true. they mentioned last week, um, built out what we know now as black and white relationship portraits. And it's something that a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of photographers um, started doing uh, after they saw Bev and Tim. It's kind of evolved over the decades, wouldn't you say, mm -hmm. in our industry. And I think um, that so much of that, obviously they're not the only people to photograph black and white, but so much of us learned that style and that pensive reflectiveness and um, just timeless, timeless quality of his images um, by studying with Tim and Bev. So I'm glad, thank you, Rod, for pulling this up because, you know, one of the things that they do, I can't remember if he mentioned this last week, but um, they will never shoot color in a black and white relationship session. So color is one session, black and white is another session, never the two shall meet. And, um, and I think that's really powerful because it gives them, uh, it gives their clients something to come back to. And then like Bev was saying, it just really lets them hone in on the purpose of that session. And, um, and it's just, it's just gorgeous as you can see. But I think the key here is that we can look at any of these and know that they're Tim and Bev's. Bev is a, is a gorgeous painter in her own right. Um, and has her own line of portraits at the studio called Beau Visage, which means beautiful face. She came out with that, what, 10, 12 years ago? Yeah, we were all, it was like revolutionary mm -hmm. in our industry. We were like, why do they always come up with all the cool things? Mm -hmm. so, um, so her work is usually very colorful. It's painted, um, still timeless, but she, I love this, um, I love this collection here because it just really shows you she's a little bit avant-garde too. So, and like, it, you know, and by the <clears> way, you know, it's very small smart because they're in Lexington, Lexington, Kentucky. I'm talking like Scott, you know, but they're in Lexington, Kentucky. And, you know, the Southern part of the United States has a very strong tradition of painted portraits. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, you know, they're, they're building on that. They're following up, you know, they're, they're giving their clients uh, something that they can, you know, uh, imitate what their parents, grandparents, great grandparents, you know, have done. So, you know, it's really perfect for where they live. Yep. Cool. I was saying something, but you interrupted me, so now I forgot. Oh, okay. <laughs> we'll come back to it. I'm, I'm sure. <laughs> Rod. 
Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, there's so much to unpack in this conversation. I don't know where to begin. So I'm just going to begin. So for me, honestly, a lot of what I've learned about um, style and then how to market it and work with it, I've learned from Monica and him. <laughs> <laughs> like seriously, like they've taken it to a whole nother level. You know, like I figured out how to do, I figured out my style, but how to take it to the next place. Maybe that's our next conversation. But so here's the things that I'm looking for when I'm going, when I'm looking at, um, looking for style. Um, and I'm probably just honestly, um, hold on. Oh, sorry, I had it pulled up and then I put it away. Uh, is okay. So the first thing I'm looking for, or when I'm creating a style, is how, like <clears throat> Tim was talking about, everyone was talking about it. How does it feel to you? How does it relate to your life? And so for me, I, uh, uh, my background's in art and I love art and I love paintings and I love like John Singer Sargent and all the things. So I wanted to create a style that felt right to me. So I started there, but so what, what, to me, a style is this, it's about color palette. It's about, it's, there's several elements. You've got color palette to work with. What color palette do you like to work in? Um, what clothing style do you want to work in? What expressions are you going to go with? What type, what style of lighting are you going to use? What is the posing going to be like? Um, and, um, and then what type of backgrounds are you going to be using? You know, is it location? Is it whatever, you know, so that all it's, everything is themed and thought out. So I wrote down every single one of those areas and then honed in exactly and wrote them down and said, I'm not wavering from this box. This is what, what I want to go into. And this is what I'm going to create. And the reason is, is because I love Sargent. I love all the things and I love, um, that old world Rembrandt lighting, but I also have like teenage kids and I photograph a lot of high school seniors. So I also really like, you know, like more funky fashion, you know, kind of a look and how can I meld the two together? So for me, it's really about melding classical lighting, classical clothing, classical backgrounds, and then <clears throat> putting in like just really interesting, unique posing and funky and, and awkward. Uh, John Singer Sargent used to do hundreds of sketches of people and study them and watch them. And if you read his journals, he talks about awkward and, and weird and strange. And those are the things that he was looking for were those little moments where the hand fell off the side of the chair, that one where the daughter's laying her head on her mom. And it's, it's so awkward because she has no neck. Her chin is just like, that but that's them that's their story like Bev and Tim were talking about that's what they want to see and that's the story they want to tell so what I tell people when I'm creating images for them is this in a consultation is that we're going to set the stage so we're going to make the stage perfect we're going to have everything lined up the clothing the lighting the style the composition the background everything is going to be there it's going to be beautiful but then what I want to see happen is I want it to fall apart and so as soon as it starts falling apart, that's what I'm looking for. So don't feel like if your child is, you know, not doing or not cooperating or if, you know, so-and-so's ornery or whatever, it doesn't really, that tells that story. That's what I'm looking for. I think about the, my own portrait that I had taken with my children when they were really young. And my favorite portrait was just one little teeny moment, one shot where my daughter reached up and touched my wife's face you know, underneath her chin as she was looking at her baby sister. It's like, ugh, yes, that tells the story. It's so sweet. It's so awesome. You know, it's one finger touching a cheek and I am melting, you know? I'm like, I love, love, love this. And it's that, it's that when things kind of fall apart, they become real and authentic, even though they may be a little awkward and you understand posing. Like I understand posing, I understand all the things, you know what I mean? Don't put their arm, you know, all the, you know, rules, your arm doesn't go like this, doesn't go like this. I get that, I put that together, but I want one piece of that, one element of that to fall apart and, and tell their story. So that's kind of how I set the stage for style and pose and all the things for um, creating that. So um, mm -hmm. I, uh, David Peters always had a good question too that I use um, in consultation, which is which of your, uh, kids is most like you. 
And then you find out about them because <laughs> without asking them about themselves and they'll be like, oh, they're artsy. And you're like, oh, you're artsy. And then which one's most like your husband? And then they're like, oh, this one's really like, you know, about the numbers and, you know, da, 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 you know, like that kind of a person or whatever. And you're like, oh, okay. So I need when I'm selling, <laughs> I know who, what I need to say and who I need to talk to and what words to use when we come back to, to, to finalize everything. He's not going to, he, you know, he's not going to be like, uh, you know, crying. No. I, I would be the crier, but yeah, <laughs> I cry at commercials. Anyway, <laughs> so um, that's kind of how we set everything up. So um, for setting that up. So yeah, I do some of my work, I guess. That's probably I what wanna, I should do. I want to, I want to oh, yeah. interject real quick because I want to, I want to touch on something that Tim and Bev were talking about in the beginning of the video. And they said, you know, don't take somebody's style and look at it and say, I'm going to do this, but I'm just going to do it better. And so I understand that. I get that. But I want to pose it of the person. If I was just walking into, you know, I, I just walked into B&H and I bought my first digital camera, right? I'm, I'm setting the stage over here. As we all should. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Or, you know, they're, they're a decent place to go. <laughs> uh, and, you know, I walk out and I decide, you know, I'm going to do, I'm going to do portraits. That's, that's where I want to go. Now, obviously at that point, I, I don't have a style. I, I've probably only seen maybe, you know, Monica's work or Rod's work. And then I'm going to go. And I think our, our first inclination is to mimic that because we don't know that. So from there, I guess the, the question that I'm trying to get at is how do you use that as kind of a jumping point to then define your own style? Obviously, you're going to copy somebody at some point. It's, it's got to be done. But how do you take that and then mold that, which I do believe, you know, they were kind of insinuating of that to now create what becomes yours? Well, you know, that's, you know, that's of course, common in school, in uh, art school, in colleges, universities, uh, adult education. You know, you're taking, uh, if you go do a painting class, uh, you go select a a painting that was done and you start out by uh, getting the charcoal out on the canvas and doing the oil painting and stuff like that. And that's the same thing uh, with photography. Uh, you see images that maybe Annie's done or something in Vanity Fair or an ad and you look at that. But the important thing about that and about copying and mimicking when you start is that you're learning the technique. You know, you're getting comfortable with the camera. You're camera. getting uh, comfortable with how the light is falling on the face and recognizing that you're getting comfortable with interacting, you know, with people. So you're kind of, you kind of getting your wings, mm -hmm. you know, you're getting your foundation, you're building that up. So when you start to really uh, cr develop and develop your own style and your own personality is that you have this foundation, but then you're striving to go and, and reach in, to yourself and say, okay, what is my interest? What is part of my personality? What is, how can I do this and make it a little bit different? You know, I, I'm working on a project now, I'll talk about it a little bit, but you know, I actually want to get into situations that are a little bit harder because I don't want to just do something easy. I want something that makes me draw from really deep within myself. So, you know, it's no, it's great to start out by copying, mimicking, uh, trying to do something you see on Instagram or whatever, because that's how you learn to walk. Well, I think you, I think the key word there was technique. I think that's a really, mm -hmm. really good point because um, we all study photographers work who we admire and we dissect the images, we deconstruct and where's the light coming from? How many lights are they using? Are they filling? Are they subtracting? So I think we're all doing that all of the time, but it is, it's, I think that's a really, really good point that it's about technique. And then for me, the litmus test, Scott, is when like there was a photographer several years ago and I was just convinced this is what I was supposed to do. And um, so I mimicked, you know, bought all the classes, mastered it very, very quickly, um, did it for about a year, made a lot of money at it. Um, but I was so unfulfilled. Like I was just so bored and it really wasn't true to my personality. And I had to make the decision to kind of just pivot a little bit, but there were still 
lessons from mm-hmm. that, techniques from that, mm-hmm. that I learned that were invaluable that I employ now, but the style is completely different because that was not my heart. And I think that's a good litmus test. If you are not excited about that session walking in the door, then there's probably a good chance that um, you got to make some changes. It's a really good point. And you do, you have to learn all these different techniques because you don't know which one's going to fit you. You know, it's like a movie set, you know, you, you want to tell a story. How are you going to tell that story? What's the best lighting composition, posing all the things that make sense for you. So you will have to learn a lot of different techniques to find that place for you. So yeah, I used to look at magazines and photos and like look, look really close in the catch eyes and go, Oh, they used a square softbox in the eight o'clock position and then a reflector over here you know and so you try to like you like that so you try to recreate that and I think one thing that you really helped me with was I would bring you things and I would say like I love this and so this is the lighting I want to replicate and you would say that's not perfect like that's not the only way to shoot that And because I was feeling very much like if I didn't nail it exactly how I was looking at it, that I was failing and you were always like, but that's not the only way to shoot that. And it should have more of your personality. I just want to share. You know, and also, you know, like, especially when she started out, you know, if I looked, when I looked at images of when she really started and, you know, she just dove in, you know, she didn't have, she didn't have the opportunity to go to photography school like I did and have all the different studios to work for, but when she started out, she was using her feeling and emotion and, and the interest that she had in the people in front of her and captured that. So I'm always on her about, hey, it, it doesn't have to be technically perfect. Wait, you, what? <laughs> no, I say what? you need to use your feeling because you're trying to imitate some of this lighting. But if you, if you just trust yourself, you know, to feel that, you know, I think all of us, while we say you got to do this, learn this, study this, maybe copy this a little bit, it's just we all want you to set the bar higher for yourself. And you know, you there, sh- there's more to then than just copying Annie or Gregory Heisler or whoever it is. Well, and I always feel like, and then Rado, I want you to show your work. And then I have like my list of notes that I want to make sure I <laughs> don't forget. But um, exactly. I always feel like uh, what I ask myself, like, what is the work that I want to leave behind? Like, what is the legacy that I want to leave? What is the work that I want to be known for? And we put out a lot of great work at the studio. We've done that consistently myself for 23 years, yourself for a hundred. So I feel like, you know, we can do that, but at the end of the day, what is the work that when I'm long gone and they, and somebody says, Oh, Monica Sigmund did that portrait. Like what are the words that they come, that come to their mind and you know, what did I leave behind? So I'm always kind of thinking about that. And I would encourage others to think of that too, because, you know, we don't sell digital files. We sell prints. We believe in the printed portrait and we know these portraits are going to last for generations. And so is that portrait that's going to be hanging on their wall one day for their grandchildren to see, you know, something just spectacular? Is it like just iconic? Is it all of those things, or is it just ordinary? You know, is it something that wasn't really yours and in your heart? So, so I guess they're going to say wet plate for me, huh? Yes. Okay. To Gara, right. um, Rado, do you want to show your work real quick and sure. then, like talk about quick. that style that you were discussing? Absolutely. So these are some of the elements that I was talking about. You should write these down for yourself. A description of of what you want to do, what it sounds like to the client, what clothing and props you're going to use, what background and lighting you're going to use, um, expression and pose. And then this I learned with some other things added on for later on. So there we go. So anyway, um, sorry, I can't close that out. And you know what? We're going to add that, Rado, I think, to our PDF that we did not get uploaded. We didn't get it uploaded for this week because Leah was out, but we'll get it up next week and um, we'll have a whole PDF on style for everybody. All right. Yay. So this is kind of the look that I was talking about, which is, you know, the Rembrandt lighting mixed in with 
some funky posing. So like those two boys are twins and he's just, you know, in a really interesting, awkward kind of pose. And then I also use this for high school seniors, of course, um, but it has a, everything has like a warm skin tone and then a coolish type of background. And I like that just a position of the two together and then just letting them move and study and watch them for just the most subtle of things is what I do. So again, just very not typical, you know, it's, inter he just, he was just, you know how it is. We call it the, Michael knows, we call it the 13th frame. So in the old days when we had film, <laughs> if you were lucky on a roll of 12 exposures on your form, medium format camera, you'd end up with uh, one more frame. Um, so you'd be winding your camera and you're like, oh, I think I got one more. So you're looking at your camera. And then when you peeked up and you saw the person, they finally relaxed because you weren't looking at them, studying them or whatever. And they... They, they fell, they, you know, that became the awkward moment that came the authentic them. And then that was the 13th frame you, you capture it. So that's kind of the look that I'm going for is, you know, some of the classics, but then intermix with just a little bit of awkwardness to it. So. But also so timeless. It's still yeah, timeless with so the timeless Rembrandt stuff. lighting and. Yeah. And, and the formality too. of it, the formality yeah. of it. It's I like putting things like everything to be perfect, like when you walk in the door and then let it fall apart in the image, you know, like just let her lean her head like that. Let her fall like that. Let him get relaxed, you know, and just let it be real as, as you can be and somewhat awkward. So that's my thing. Well, and I think, too, like I always love, um, <clears throat> at the, especially at the beginning of each like pose or what whatever you know or each set or whatever and I'll I'll say you know go stand over there let me do a couple things I'm set right like the camera's good the lights are good we're ready to go but I kind of walk away and I'll look at my camera a little bit and I'll say and they'll be like what do you want us to do where do you want us to sit I'm like just relax for a second I'm you know I'm just looking at a couple things here just double checking and I'm really kind of watching right we all do this we're kind of watching to see how does dad, dad stand normally like where are the little bonds and the relationships like which sisters are talking or whatever. And then we build off of that. We use that because that's, the, that's not only uncomfortable for them, but it's authentic to who they are. And so if I see a kid who has his hands in his pockets, like that's just how he's relaxing, then I'm probably going to start there and not start with him, um, you know, crossing his arms or anything. So, you know, well, you know, right. I think you, can, you can feel it. Yeah. Sorry, but yeah, I remember, I don't know who was, who taught us this, but was the, you know, if you put two people together and then the one is like tipping away from them, you're like, oh, I probably shouldn't have put those two people together. They're not getting along right now. So yeah, you have to cue in on those feelings of and authenticity. So go ahead, Michael. Sorry. It's all right. You know, I think what Rod's portraits really show is uh, life, you know, and naturalness. Um, Gainsborough, um, if you would look at some of his paintings, he would have the ruffle on the end of a underneath the coat in the shirt, the long sleeve shirt, uneven. He would have mm -hmm. a button unbuttoned, you know, and that sit that sitter came into that Gainsborough studio 40 or 50 times. I don't think that guy had that third button down on his shirt unbuttoned every time. But what Gainsborough was trying to do was not to make everything so perfect that you took the life out of that subject. So Rod is letting the life come back into those people and that subjects and that family. He's still flattering them. But when you get um, that realness, um, there's depth to it. So there's not a sanitized, artificial, so perfect that it's not a real person yeah. anymore. So... Okay, so I just wanted to share um, a couple of slides. So thank you, let Michael. <laughs> me go to share screen. And do you guys uh, see, is it sharing the yes. Yes. Sigmund Taylor screen up there? Okay, so um, when we were talking about um, 
you know, getting influenced versus copying, right? So everybody knows how to do this already, <laughs> but one thing I like to do is I will Google their na the name of the person, the artist that I'm super inspired by or curious about, and then I'll click on that images tab. And then what this allows me to do is see a bird's eye view, right? So Sargent is also one of my influences, um, favorite artists. And so obviously I'm gonna study his work individually, but I also think it's quite valuable to look at the bird's eye view and say, why is this appealing to me? Like, what is it? Is it the colors? Is it the mood? Is it the, co the composition, the consistent cropping that he's he does so often? Like. What is it about his work? Same with Mark Seliger, right? Like I look at these and it's just, there's a consistency in what I'm curious about from his portraits. So I think sometimes that bird's eye view really helps in addition to studying images independently, which is also really important. And so I think, you know, a photographer told me a long time ago that the more you can um, study and share and, uh, sorry, I'm talking like share screen, stop sharing. Um, the more you can study and just really almost memorize these images, what you're doing is building templates in your brain. And so mm -hmm. what you're doing by that is it's the same as getting technically proficient in your gear like it's it's just there in the back of your mind and there are plenty of times where i'm posing and i'll get an image and i'll be like that's it i can't maybe articulate exactly why in that moment but when i sit down and i'm going through the images and i go oh that's because the way she's turned reminded me of that taylor swift cinderella portrait that annie Leibovitz did the way her hair went over her shoulder in that certain way and so i can't articulate that during the shoot, but I recognized it because I was building this library of templates in my brain, if that makes sense. So I think that that's really, really important. And that way you're not like printing out those images, bringing them into the camera room, trying to reproduce, but you kind of know it when you see it, what, what it is that's appealing to you. So I think that's really important. I always laugh because Rod is very systematic and I'm very systematic compared to you. Like you laugh at me, but then I laugh at Rod because I'm like, oh my God, he, he thought about all those things. And I am still like, I'm always, I will always call myself the accidental artist because I <laughs> half the time just d don't know what I'm doing. And I feel like I fall into things, but um, for me, it, it was way more emotional and then learning kind of um, the technique that I wanted secondarily. So um, 23 years ago when I started, I did a lot of black and white images. I don't have them because they were on film, so I don't have them to share, but um, a lot of black and white, a lot of funny crops, a lot of um, storytelling and relationship portraits. And then we really built the studio on location work, family portraits, bigger groups, and, um, and that became our reputation. So a few years ago, I was really feeling like I wanted a challenge and there was something that I was still not creatively fulfilling. And, um, and so I started a studio portrait line called Black Label. And so um, what I wanted to do is show you just a few of those images because um, even though they are stylistically so different than what I did a hundred years ago, um, they are very similar in the relationship and the storytelling. So for me, it's, again, I'm also very fond of, you know, a very like one directional light source, um, more dramatic and cinematic in its feeling, more serious expressions. They can be happy, but I don't want, you know, big toothy smiles. You know, we didn't see that in classic portrait painters you know, art, we don't see teeth. And, um, and so something like this is again, to Rod's, what he was saying about his work, a little bit more modern, but timeless, um, just storytelling, you know, this was, this was one of those in-between moments where I really had a vision that I wanted them all looking at me. I don't know how I thought that was going to happen with a 12 month old and, and, um, four-year-old, three-year-old Hadley, but this, so this was one of those in-betweens, the 13th frame, right? And, but it tells the whole story of their family. Like she's just smack dab in the middle of it, commanding, you know, the attention. 
Um, and again, this is one where I was kind of like, wow, that pose turned out really, really nice. I wonder how I did that. And then when I started thinking about it, it goes, it's very similar to a John Singer Sargent pose of three sisters where she's draped over the lap. And so I'm like, that's why it looks correct in the studio because it's familiar. So the more you can study and build those templates, the more familiar things are, then you can really kind of move in that direction in the studio. So even taking something like this little boy's uh, baseball portrait, um, you know, just doing it a little bit more timelessly, just these quiet expressions, um, and so you see there's a similar, a similarity and this one, you know, those little girls, like they were not having it. They were not going to look at me. They were done. They just weren't going to do it. So like you guys are all saying, you know, go with it. What's happening. What's the story. And they don't have to be looking at the camera. <laughs> um, these are really good portrait photographer friends of ours. Um, little boy with his sweet little dog who um, they actually had to give some puppy Prozac to and they went a little overboard and um, this was the last image we have of him awake. Um, <laughs> but so you can get a feeling for, you yeah, know, sure. the, the work, I, the work kind of is similar, right? Like the feel, the idea is that hopefully you can go to, you know, the Instagram feed and you can say, oh, you know what, that's, that's the work that Monica has been doing. And so that's the goal. That's the goal is to have it look, um, consistent and familiar and, um, and build, build on that all the time. So, um, I, I think that that was the main thing I wanted to just say, you know, study, 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 and build those templates so that when you're in the camera room, things look familiar. It feels right. You know, you're, you're not thinking, it, you should know it as inside out as you know your gear. So that's all I have for now. It's a really good point. Your turn. Okay. <laughs> you want your slides first? Sure. Okay. Uh, and so the work is gorgeous. <laughs> Thanks. You know what, though? It's like, it's exactly what I felt like I was supposed to be doing <clears throat> and what I want to leave behind. So, and I think I can, I can stay true to that style, but still, um, still level up, still improve, still make some tweaks and changes, but it will still look familiar. So, mm -hmm. all right, <clears throat> passing it over to the master here. So yeah. when I, when I started out, you know, I started out uh, <clears throat> taking a photography class in high school and I went down to the local bookstore and I bought a book called one mind's eye by Arnold Newman. Mm -hmm. And so who does that in high school, right? You know, it's just crazy, you know, and I was able to talk to Arnold about that a couple of times, you know, and I actually, Arnold's the only person I ever had an autograph from, and uh, he signed uh, one of the copies of the book. And, um, but I've, I've always loved working on location, be it outdoors, being in somebody's home, in some office space. I really like getting out of the camera room and going on to location because I love the challenge. I love the beauty of it. I love the challenge. I think it's uh, amazing. So what Monica wanted me to do is I'm, this first set of portraits that I'm showing you are 30 to 40 years old. Okay. So uh, she thought it would be great for me to show that I have stayed in this lane. When I first started, I worked at a studio <clears> that <throat> all we did was location portraits in people's homes and out in their yards and things like that. And I kind of stayed true to that. Um, on my 41st, 42nd year, uh, like I said, this was done in probably 92, 93 in Vegas. You know, I love the back up real quick. I love doing portraits like this where you show the environment and show the space and all that, but the people aren't lost a half mile away from the camera. You can still see the people, but you still see the beauty and the space around them. So I love that idea. Uh, this next portrait was done uh, in Tuscany on one of the workshops we did over there, just all that beautiful texture, uh, light overhead, a little translucent silver underneath. Um, the next one's of, this was done in 94, uh, some, uh, granddaughters over at grandma's house. Um, they just, she, they came over, she had all these outfits as a surprise for them. So they were 
loving it. They just love being able to dress up and just window light portrait, little Koken uh, Sunsoft filter on there. The bows are bigger than their head. That's the yeah. only thing that will date that is like the bows. <laughs> and, yeah, that, for sure. Uh, this portrait was actually done in 1981. A uh, little fashion shoot uh, that I did in Memphis. Memphis was uh, where the studio was located. Uh, my first job out of Brooks Institute. Uh, this next portrait was done for uh, an ad for the Ritz Carlton in Pasadena, uh, probably 1990, somewhere around there. Uh, the next portrait is typical of the portraits we did in the homes. Uh, there was a lot of beautiful homes, of course, in the Pasadena, San Marino area. Uh, just trying to marry the subjects with the environment. A couple of lights bounce off the wall to create a wall of light. But, you know, what's really nice about it is, uh, you know, I don't really think it looks like it was done in the 90s, does it? You know, so when you really capture things with honesty and a little bit of tradition, you know, it doesn't really date itself, which I really love. And one thing I just, I, I know we're going to scroll through these, but one thing I want to mention because, um, I don't think in all of our B and H talks we've really spent a lot of time looking at your lighting. It's been mm -hmm. mostly all about me. <laughs> 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 so, um, so one thing I want to mention as you look through Michael's work is he is like a master of always having foreground, middle ground, and background as points of interest. So I can guarantee you just having photographed with Michael now as long as I have, this probably was not in that location are you talking about the table, the table, the right. table. like right. you moved it to it was probably like directly in front of the sofa yeah because i wanted to balance out uh, with the light the wall right so that. he will move that off to use that as a vignette give us some foreground background middle ground so i just wanted to um mention that because as we go through the rest of these images i think you'll be able to notice that like if we go back to this one same thing with this table that chair i'm sure wasn't there you pulled mm -hmm. it into place so mm -hmm. that you would have those leading lines and whatnot so okay carry on just typical portrait in grandma's backyard. Uh, this is a friend of ours, uh, Bert Binky, up in Chicago in the next one. Oh, a series oh my that, God, it's Bert. Yeah, a series that I did. Oh He's a little bit grayer now, but you know, um, just, you know, this, I don't think that portrait's standable. You know, that was done, I think, in 1998. Oh, wait, this one. Uh, that, that one and, and the young ladies. No, this one you did in Williamsburg. No, you sure? Yeah. Oh, I'm so sorry. I know the client. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, okay. Well, thanks for bringing that out. I appreciate that. Yeah. So, so we're going to transition, you know, and my love is to tell that story all the time. And, and I, I always want to, what I want to do is make sure that that client, that person stands out, that environment's not overwhelming the people, but that environment is telling a story and complimenting uh, the personality of those people in front of me. Um, and so these are some of the parts I did this portrait about a month ago, uh, up in Michigan. Um, interesting guy. I was going to be up in Michigan. So I looked around on the internet, find some interesting people and I got in touch with them and said, Hey, I would really love to create some portraits of you. And sometimes it takes a lot of phone calls and a lot of emails and a lot of begging, but, uh, he finally accepted. So, but I think it's still a reflection of my personality. Uh, this is a costume designer up at the Jamestown Museum. We did a project for the Jamestown Yorktown Museums to show some of the behind the scenes workers. Uh, this is uh, Sarah Petty and her family up in Springfield, Illinois. She's a wonderful photographer and marketer. Uh, wanted us to come up and do a series of portraits over a couple of days to. Uh, uh, show off her family, but also use it for marketing for her business and her husband's business, who's an architect. Uh, this was at uh, the building that is half portrait studio, half architectural firm, but it's all their personality. And uh, we just want to have fun with it. Uh, just have a all rhythm to it. This is one image. It's not composited, all one shot. Um, fortunately, he didn't blind himself with the blades of the drone. So, you know, this is part of that Jamestown, Yorktown Foundation. This is one of the archivists back in the back. 
family portrait, little strobe bounced off the left-hand side with available light. Um, so you just do such a really good job of putting people in their environment. And I think like a lot of photographers, and I'm not saying, I'm not excluding myself in this, <laughs> Like we would walk into a room like this and our inclination would be to put these guys back up against the fireplace, right? Like right. back up against the beautiful decor or whatever. And you always remind me that again, it's like putting the family against the mountains, you know, they're going to be this big, like what's important. So just by bringing them forward there, they become the middle ground. And, you know, then you've got this, you flattered her with the curve of the sofa. And then, you know, you've got that, um, their family portraits on the desk in front that just tell so much story. Yeah, I actually placed those little portraits in front of there. And I moved that stat, uh, the horse statue there, because he had a little bit of a hard time standing for a long time. So he's actually holding a cane and supporting himself. But I didn't want him to be embarrassed you know, to have to, to have that cane shown. He said it was okay, but still, you know, uh, it was just a subtle way for me to be able to hide that cane and him have some dignity. Good job, Mike. So, you know, yeah. you know, I most of our, I you know, most of our, you know, most of our portraits, uh, we make actually a hundred little decisions. You know, we make a couple of major decisions, but a lot of our portraits, when we try to raise it up to a next level, we, I have all these little subtle decisions like making her look the mom look great there so so these chairs were not um positioned like that and, and clients do freak out when we go into their homes and we start moving their furniture not because we're moving the furniture but because they're like but i would never put that chair at that angle in front of the sofa and we're like no 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 it's not going to read like that like it, you just have to kind of reassure them and so um it's just does such a great job of naturally vignetting the portrait and bringing the attention right into him this is one of our favorites it's one of our favorite clients we just love her to death and um we've been working with her for well over a decade. And I think I also have a lot of affection for this portrait because this was like the first one that you really saw, like you were like, okay, the Sony is the bomb. <laughs> like I yeah. had been shooting on, I had been shooting on Sony for a year and a half or so, and you were mm -hmm. still on another system and um, you had just switched over. And so this was one of your first portraits and you like brought out all your lights. You were going to light it with like three or four lights. And then, um, and I kept saying like, like, you're really not going to have to, you're not going to have to, you're not going to have to. And like you said, you made a million little decisions, but because we only ended up having to use one light and because we could drag the shutter, because that camera basically can see in the dark, um, everything fell into place, including the, the lamps. Yeah. The, the only thing we had to do was I used the lighting technique. It's called using a splash light. And it's a very super non-directional light source. So I bounced the light off the ceiling because this was a tiny room, all that wood paneling. It was actually very, very dark. So I wanted to retain the beautiful green, rich tones outside. I didn't want to composite it or anything like that. So I was able to keep the tones outside and the lighting because the available light coming through the window is what's lighting up her face and the dog's face. But I needed to get rid of some of that heavy, deep, dark blacks that are underneath the, the lamp tables and things like that by bouncing the strobe off the ceiling. It's a very super non-directional light source that's adding a foundational layer uh, to the dark tones in the portrait. So in combination with that and the ability of the Sony camera to have a, a greater dynamic range uh, that I haven't seen with any camera system, uh, it, it made it really a very easy portrait to do. You couldn't put a a fill light with an umbrella, you couldn't bounce a strobe off the wall behind me, but what's gonna happen? You're gonna get reflection. I know this one. Okay. <laughs> yes, Monica. <laughs> It'll reflect in the windows. You'll reflect in all those little panes, especially because like the pane on the right hand, the panes on the right hand side are angled in. So it's not one horizontal source of windows. You've got different angles of glass. So it's gonna be very difficult to move that strobe around you had to place it where you wouldn't see it in the glass so and then again you moved this plant over to 
um, create foreground, but also to flatter her sitting on the sofa. Right, so, by blocking her legs, her hips, and things like that. Yeah, so only because she made a point of that. She was concerned. Um, okay, so we have two more to, to look at real quick. Now, this is part of an artist series. I'm doing a series of portrait of artists. Uh, we're, we're calling it Art 24. Right. You are calling it art. 24. I'm calling it art 20. She told me the you are name. Calling and I, your thought project I, art I said, I like that. I, I like that name, actually. Um, I'm doing all the portraits with the Sony 24 millimeter prime. I love that lens. The that GM. lens. The gym. Yeah, it is fantastic. You'll learn. Rod, correct me if I'm wrong, but you shoot Sony too, right? Oh, I do. <laughs> <laughs> I love Tim's it. Not, Tim's not here, so we can uh, we can yeah we can just say these plugs things. now. So anyway, you know this this is the work. This is all pretty current work within the last oh mostly this last year, yeah. some couple years old, but you know still yeah you know, I'm known for the location work and uh, you know that's my personal branding. That's my style. This is the uh, style that I bring to the studio here that uh, other people around here can't do. You know? I can't so, do it. I have to, I have to jump in and I have to, I have to dig at Monica a little bit because she, she started. And so I, I get to finish, right. Right. That's how yep. it goes, Michael. Yep. But you know, I'm, I'm so glad to finally get to see some of Michael's work because I, I didn't get to see a lot of it and it's great. And I love it. And I love the, the use of the way he plays with the light. And, and we've talked about it in the past, but you really get to see it, especially like that image you were talking about in the room with the, with, you know, the open light source and, having yeah. all that dark wood paneling you know to be able to balance that is is that's that's true you know he's the best i mean there's no but Murad, I, you've been around long enough i mean you've you've watched i i knew of michael taylor long before you know we knew each other i knew of his work and studied his you know took his workshops and everything and um there's just there's net there's there's you can always tell a michael taylor portrait you can always yeah. tell a Michael Taylor portrait. And he's time. always like, oh, it's nothing. It's easy. Yeah, he I'm makes like, it. For you. Yeah, <laughs> you, look, you look at the portrait. And this is the problem when I think sometimes when he teaches, because photographers will look at the portrait and they'll be like, okay, so like, that's easy. So they're not really like paying attention to how he does it. So then they go home and they're yeah. like, oh, wait, it doesn't look like that. <laughs> like, I can't, you know, so yeah, he's, he'll have to get on here and do a little lighting webinar for you guys. yes and composition and all the things that he does i just love just sitting and just studying the images for an hour i can just sit there and go oh look at how that line leads into that line and that goes yeah. to there and that's his oh i see why that happened and that created you know this. what really and... pisses me off is oh, can I say that <laughs> sorry you can say that it's okay. it's okay what really annoys me um <laughs> not on a black label session because he usually is not here when i do a black label session but like if we're photographing a family or whatever we do those together and i'll shoot the whole session i will shoot the whole session i'm like grinding it out like maybe like i'm struggling or whatever maybe it's the best session i've ever done i'm holding the reflector he's holding the reflector <laughs> and then he'll go Oh, but I'll be like, that's it. That's a wrap. And he'll be like, can I get, can I, can I just jump in and get one? And I'm like, shit. And so he'll take no. the camera and he'll do the thing. And he takes one shot and inevitably that's the client's favorite. That's the wall <laughs> portrait. Like every single freaking time. I'm like, oh. I, I, why didn't you just shoot the whole thing? Like, He's the yeah. He's the that, that, would that would be worse. ago. That would be worse. Exactly. He's just like making me grind, grind it out. And I'm like, God bless it. And then the client's always like, I'm really sorry, but we really love that one. I'm like, I know, I know. I just, whatever. It's fine. <laughs> I think, I think, I think, you know, showcasing Michael's work is, is something that kind of ties it all back into what we kind of let off with of, you know, kind of looking at look, taking a step back and looking at a whole of somebody's work. And so, you know, like you were using Sargent as an example or Mark Seliger um, and, and looking at everything as a whole. And, you know, once you, once you mentioned and brought into, you know, the conversation about Michael and how 
you know him obviously right and, and no he's just some guy who appeared in the in the, in, in the chair next to you um <laughs> knowing knowing the way he works and knowing that you know he intentionally moved this you know piece into the to the front and then had the middle and then the background to you know create all that separation if you're able now if you were to go back at michael's work and, and look at those images you're able to say oh okay i see that yeah so I think, I, I mean, I can't speak for every, everybody else. I could speak personally and say it's really helped me just think about the way I go to even a museum and look at, you know, an artist's work because I just usually look at it as an individual piece and I never right. step back. I'm very small minded. That's the truth. <laughs> <laughs> but I, but I, never, I, never, I never take that, that time to step back and go, let me look at this collection as a whole. Right instead of just these small little one-off individual pieces, which I, I doubt is the intention of the artist to begin with. Obvi obviously, and you know, that's their intention is to look at their work and see it as a whole spectrum versus just this one individual piece, whether you're looking at the Mona Lisa, which you know is one small piece of that collection, or you know, you're looking at a whole collection in the Met maybe. But I think the rub is that those painters us as photographers, we're commissioned for those portraits individually, right? Like we are commissioned to create a portrait that represents that subject, that family, that relationship. <clears throat> so our, our, we're constantly, I, I think our challenge is constantly to um, let every family or subject be a true representation, let every portrait be a true representation of those people. And then also, have it fit in our in our collective body of work, and um, and it's you know I think that's probably a a, a tale as old as time. Yep. You no, know, having to piece of you, piece of them. Right, right, right. Satisfying that. the the wallet and your inner artist. So yeah. But you know the joy is, and we this is about style and our personal style. The joy is discovering it, going after it, and chasing that style. And the, the, wonder, the wonder of when we bring all these elements together and get that image. So that should be the joy. I mean, I do not understand photographers that keep doing the same thing over, over and over again or go to the same spot uh, location-wise and do it over and over again. Um, you know, have some joy in the creativity. You know, have some joy in, mm -hmm. you know, uh, finding solutions. Have some joy in coming up with something a little bit new. I mean, that should be where you get a lot of your joy. And that's what having a style is and chasing your style and honing your style. Because it should evolve. Right. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to end this similar to a, a famous talk show that, that was on the air. I'm not going to reference who it was because his show wasn't. <laughs> Who's coming out from behind the curtain? <laughs> but, but, uh, no, but what are, what are, what are, let's share some of our final thoughts here. Final thoughts, final thoughts on style. And, and if you know who I'm talking about, then, then you know who I'm talking about. I totally do. I yeah. would say, um, I'm going to go in front of these guys because they'll have something more profound to say than I will. But um, I am going to say not to not be discouraged if you, if you're watching this and you're like, I totally don't know my style. I photograph newborns. I photograph seniors. I photograph in the studio. I photograph on location. Like that's, it's okay if you don't know it right now. What we're here to talk about tonight and hopefully have you thinking about tonight is that you need to get to a style. And, um, and it's something that you need to really do some deep thinking about. And, and what is, I, I just think the perfect question is what is the work you want to be known for? And, um, and, but don't be discouraged if you haven't figured that out yet and you haven't figured out that you don't have to be a jack of all trades yet. So um, that's what we're, we're here to help with and, um, and don't be discouraged, so. Yeah, I think, you know, we're just, I think most importantly, we, we're here to say, set a higher bar for yourself, mm. you know? Um, realize that you are unique. When you really create portraits that have character and depth and personality, and it has a lasting quality to it, you're doing something. You have something. You're capturing it with style. And you're adding 
your own personality so that it's a little bit of a self-portrait. You know, when you add something of yourself into that portrait that you're creating, you're making something that lasts. So raise the bar for yourself. Um, And we're each made wonderfully unique, right? right? Like we're not put on this earth for me to be a copy of you or me to be a copy of Rod. Like we're put on this earth individually and uniquely to bring our own yeah. talent. And that's the joy and, mm-hmm. and, and embrace that, have that joy, have that desire to, you know, mm-hmm. to follow your own path. Don't and, be scared. Yeah. <laughs> it's wonderful. You know, it's you, awesome. you know, you know, the advantage too, is when you have your own style, your own path, it's really hard for people to crit- criticize you, you know, because you're unique. So Rado, wrap it up. It, Finish strong. Oh, All it. right, oh, here we go. <laughs> it it's okay to be you and be okay with that, you know, and use that as your superpower. So it's hard. It's hard to put yourself out there and say, this is who I am and this is what I do and this is what I love. And you, it, it's hard. But once you do that, find that place. It is a place of joy. But also, once you find that place, make it the best you possibly can. Technically, every aspect, every element, elevate it to the best you are possibly capable of and continue doing that. Continue learning, continue elevating, continue discovering. Um, and that is the, that's where the magic happens, is that you're telling their story Sorry. and interjecting your style into their story. And that's what's driving them to you is because they're drawn to that. And it's, so it is, it's you and them in a collaboration of creating art. I love that. And I, and I, I think mic drop. Oh, okay. I'll just, I'll just get off the air then. <laughs> I'll just, we'll just, we'll just hit end webinar and finish it like that. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think I think that's you know I think that ties into I, I think we had an event the other day or the day before that where where we talked about something very similar about you know it's okay to be you and it's okay to you know not be somebody else and I think that we're in a time where that message couldn't be more important and more integral to especially a lot of uh, I'll say. Uh, now, now I'm dating myself as the hundred year old guy, but the youth, uh, the youth who, who are there. Is, uh, yeah. Scott's uh, talking about the youth. Yeah, I've reached, I've reached that age. I could say youth. Uh, you know, you know, whether it be Instagram or TikTok or I, I don't even know all of the the other applications that are out there. There's so many there that puts such an emphasis on you know looking a certain way or or you know, displaying your work a certain way. And it, it couldn't be further from the truth. And as, as amazing as technology has gotten, and it, it has, obviously, you know, it, it gives us the availability, like Michael was talking about before, with the Sony cameras that we can go into a shoot and not have to bring a whole entire lighting, you know, three or four piece lighting kit and, you know, shoot at higher ISO sensitivities, you know, greater apertures, things like that. And, and that's where it's advanced. We have this we have this new kind of generation coming up that has so much pressure to not be who they are. So if you take anything away from this and and you've made it this long, thank you for staying with us. But be yourself, be proud of who you are, whatever that looks like in any facet. That's that's what makes it so wonderful is our individuality. Look, I can't even I can't even speak properly, and 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 yet here I am. And you're owning it. <laughs> Just own it. That's that's it. it. <laughs> I mean, when when you don't see me back here next week, you know that I didn't own it, and they they canned me. They were like, "Get this guy out!" <laughs> no, uh, uh, they're they're not getting rid of me that quickly. But uh, <laughs> I got ten but, years here. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Yeah. I do. Seniority. Um, <laughs> Tenure, if you will. Uh, Tenure, um, exactly. So, so I do want to remind everybody to join us next week, July 21st, 5 to 6 again. We're going to be talking about the third cornerstone, third pillar, however you'd like to refer to it. What's, do, we, do we know what that's going to be yet? Uh, yes, I believe it is about um, be building portraits that are investment worthy. Is that right, Rod? Is that topic number that three? That sounds right. Yeah. Yeah. 
Oh, Investment worthiness. Oh, awesome. I'm, I'm so back. glad that we're going to talk about that next because I had a write question. Write that down. I, I, had a, I had a question pertaining to that and I was going to ask it. And so I'm glad I'm saving it. I'm going to save it. I'm going to put it in the back of my head and forget it until next, <laughs> week, until next week when I when I take some people below that and I remember it. Uh, but I, I'll write it down somewhere so I remember because I think it'll, it'll be great with that one. But uh, Monica, Michael, Rod, I want to thank you guys for being here again. Uh, thank thank you. everybody at home for tuning in. Uh, but that's it. That's uh, that's the file and figuring it out. Uh, thanks so much for joining us. This has been another edition of the B&H Virtual Event Space. We'll catch you next time. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.